Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the webinar. My name's Lynn Hunt. I'm a training consultant with the Supply Chain School. I'm an equality diversity specialist. So this is why we're working together on this webinar this morning. This is an entry level session by which we mean I will cover as much as I can in the 45 minutes we have to give you a flavour of this. I'll be referring you on to places where you can find out a bit more and where you can dig in a bit more deeply. But the, the idea of this is to give you an overview, a flavour and an introduction to what is a fascinating and, and much more complex topic. So specifically, this is what we're going to explore in the time we have together. We're going to explore the impact of micro behaviours at work. We're going to see how bias can cause negative things called micro inequities and micro aggressions, and we'll explore those in more detail. We're going to look at ways we can combat micro inequities and micro aggressions to create a more inclusive working environment and look at a couple of very practical ways we can eliminate micro inequities and micro aggressions, both in terms of our own personal behaviours and in terms of how we influence others and our work based culture. And then we will look at these great little things, positive micro behaviours called micro affirmations, which are wonderful things. And they're the antidote to all the negative things that we'll be exploring earlier on in the session. So let's start to explain and put this into context. So you've probably heard of the term micro behaviors, maybe when you've been looking at unconscious bias, you know, m maybe in other, other areas. But what does it mean? And more importantly, what kind of impact can it have on inclusion and inclusive cultures in your workplace? So we're going to start with a few definitions and then we're going to go on and explore the practical implications of that. Micro behaviors have been defined as tiny, often unconscious gestures. They can be facial expressions, they can be the way we appear, our words, our tone of voice, our body language. And these can influence how included or not included the people around us feel. Micro behaviors have been acknowledged and recognized for some time. And in fact, the term was coined by psychologist Mary Rowe right back in the early 70s. So she looked at micro inequities and microaggression, and these are ways that individuals might be singled out, overlooked or ignored, and they're very often based on a characteristic and aspect of their identity. So typically it could be things like their race or their sex or their age, or it could be something less tangible like personality style, level of seniority in the business, that kind of thing, but very often attributed to one or more characteristics, which singles that person out as being different in some way from the majority. And she was building on earlier work by somebody called Chester Pierce in the 1970s about microaggressions. So let's break this down a little bit. Micro inequities, they are apparently small events apparently being the operative word, which are often ephemeral and hard to prove, often covert. So we're not looking at obvious, blatant racism, sexism, homophobia, disabledism, or any other ism you care to mention. They are horrible. They have no place anywhere in the world. But the very blatancy of their nature, horrible though they are, makes them clear to deal with. They're out in the open, they're obvious. We will have zero tolerance to those behaviours across our organisations. They will count as gross misconduct in our policies. They will often be illegal. They will often result in disciplinary action or maybe even instant dismissal. So the way forward is clear. micro and microaggressions, it's not that clear because they appear to be small, they appear to be hidden. The person doing them is often either completely unaware they're doing them, they don't intend to do them, or if they have some awareness, they don't intend any harm by them. So the person on the receiving end therefore finds them hard to deal with because they're feeling slighted, they're feeling uncomfortable, they're feeling humiliated, but they almost think, but it's such a tiny thing. So should I be feeling like this? I mean, am I overreacting? Am I imagining it? So that they are often unintentional. That's the way to, to think about it frequently unrecognized by the person doing them. And of course, if they're unintentional and unrecognized by the person doing them, the person doing them will happily carry on doing them. But the important thing to bear in mind is it's always due to the fact that somebody is perceived as being different. 
And microaggressions were coined by Chester Pierce as every day insults and disrespect that people of minority backgrounds typically deal with. So microaggressions came out of the work that Chester Pierce was doing into race and to racism. So microaggressions now are used in a wider context than to apply to just race, but we need to remember that they very often do apply to race and people from minority ethnic backgrounds experience microaggressions to a greater extent and in a way that that people from a white background do not experience. Where do they come from then? They're based on, oh, it's subconscious biases, implicit biases, and then they form our thoughts and behaviours and actions. So we're influenced by all sorts of things subconsciously, which will cause us to make snap judgments about somebody, which will cause us to subconsciously stereotype somebody. And the way we view that person and the way we've judged that person will manifest itself and show itself in the micro behaviours that we display. And whilst we may, may be unaware that we're displaying these micro inequities and microaggressions, they will be only too apparent to the person on the receiving end and they will hurt the person on the receiving end. So typically in a one minute conversation between two individuals, there might be as many as 50 micro messages transmitted between those two people. Now they can be positive and negative, but that's a lot of little hidden messages, isn't it? In just a one minute conversation. And even when we're not noticing them subconsciously, people will home in on them and their unconscious brain will pick them up. So more and more organisations are striving to create inclusive cultures in the workplace. They, they want to improve employee engagement. They know it helps career progression. They know it helps overall performance in the workplace, you know, individually and across the business. But there are some areas that are particularly hard to tackle, like unconscious bias, because people aren't aware of them. So what are examples of micro behaviours then? It might be a quick glance at a clock during a conversation. It might be checking your phone during a meeting. It might be rushing and rushing and implying that you're just that little bit busier than everybody else. Now, these actions certainly don't intend to hurt the other person, but they do give away a lot about what you're thinking and they can send powerful messages to the people around you. But like I say, these micro behaviours can be hard to identify. And when the person on the receiving end do, do actually identify them and think, well, hang on a bit, the fact that she keeps looking at her phone when I'm trying to make a point in this meeting, that doesn't make me feel good. But it can still be hard to explain. So, you know, you say, look, I felt really offended because she glanced at her phone when I was speaking. And then the person thinks, does that sound a bit silly? Am I making a fuss about nothing? So since these behaviours have been labelled micro, they, they're often regarded as insignificant. But we will see now that they can significantly impact the level of inclusion and value that we feel. So they can actually make us feel devalued. It can impact our sense of motivation in the job and in interacting with people around us. So what I'd like to do is to ask you to reflect I'm going to put a list up on the screen now. You'll see the examples of micro inequities come up on the screen. And I'd like you just to reflect when I put them up. And I'm going to ask you to reflect on two things. Have all or any or some of these ever happened to you? And if the answer to that is yes, think about how did you feel at the time they happened? So let me pop the list up now. So, and we'll run through them together. So you're talking to someone and they're half listening to you and they're rattling off a few emails or they're doing a quick text while they're trying to talk to you at the same time. You've corrected the pronunciation of your name to somebody. The person just keeps on getting it wrong. So you've just given up trying. You think, well, I've told them six times. They're not getting it right. I'll just give up. You realise that somebody keeps crashing your sentences. They keep interrupting you before you've finished. I'm afraid that's a real bad one that I have. I need to work on that one. And I know I have to, but that's a bad one for me. You're in a group and you're aware that some people are getting more eye contact than others. Or you might be aware that everybody else is being included in the eye contact, but you're not. You're being missed out. Or you're in a meeting and you're aware that some people are being given more airtime than others, their questions are being answered more than other people. You might find that other people answer a question and it's seized upon and answered. You've asked something and it's ignored. You're left off a list, a networking list, a project list, that kind of thing, a social list. And you go to a meeting and you're there and you receive quite a perfunctory introduction. So, oh, hi, Lynn. And then 
next it's oh i would like to really warmly welcome uh sue to the meeting today sue thank you so much to, for joining us you come up with an idea at the meeting and they say okay well thanks lynn we'll bear it in mind and then 10 minutes later someone else comes up with the same idea oh my goodness jamal that's what a great idea you know what we really need to think about that hey thank you so much for that and you think well hang on a bit it wasn't such a great idea when i came up with it 10 minutes earlier was it you are aware that when somebody is talking to somebody in your group, their voice becomes really interested and animated and they're saying, hey, you know what, that happened to me exactly the same as it happened to you. And, and how did you feel about that? And then when they're talking to you, they're saying, oh, yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm sure that's the way you must have felt about it, Lynn. So, um, yeah, anyway, moving on. Somebody's got one of those fake fixed expressions, uh, you know, those force, those masked smiles that, that think they're just anything but happy. Some people say they can read into people's eyes, that the eyes are giving away what the rest of the face or the words aren't saying. You move into a conversation. So maybe an example might be, you know, back in the days before lockdown, when we were doing a lot of networking, you turn up at a networking meeting Nobody knows anybody else much, but the idea is, is to make new connections. So you walk into a group carrying a warm orange juice and a limp sandwich. Remember the days? <laughs> and uh, you stand there and the group carry on and they, they don't even look at you. They don't even make eye contact. They don't say, oh, hi. Um, we were just talking about, you know, the new legislation. What do you think? Nothing at all. It's just like you're invisible. So you stand there feeling awkward for a few seconds and then you walk away feeling rejected. So somebody is you're talking to someone and they just keep looking at their phone and they're going oh that's very interesting ah look kittens oh that's so cute ah, sorry what are you saying you know or looking at your watch which is the sort of low-tech version of looking at your phone or that thing that is so hard to put your finger on that you're sitting there in a group and all of a sudden you say something and all of a sudden the rest of the group there's that kind of little hidden grin or that uh, or that little look between them that, it, that includes everybody but you and you just made to feel really awkward and you think have i said something funny have i said something that i shouldn't have and you just left hanging there so these are examples of micro inequities. Have you ever experienced micro inequities? This is very interesting and completely unsurprising. But by far, the vast majority of us have experienced micro inequities. OK, next question. Thinking about the micro inequity that gets to you the most, the one that really gets to you. So that might be one of the ones that I read out that you were reflecting on as I read out. It might be something else that was triggered as a result of me sharing that with you. But how do you feel as a result? Incidentally, the word that comes up the biggest is the one that most of you have put. So the, the bigger they get, the more of you have put that. And look at some of these. Frustrated, unimportant, excluded, not part of the team, annoyed, devalued, insignificant, undermined, overlooked, insulted, frustrated, embarrassed, infuriated, alone. Absolutely, people, you know, people be made to feel alone, being left out, being left off, all that kind of thing, not valued, unimportant, insignificant. Just look at this, how it's going on. Says it all, doesn't it? Anxious, worthless. You know, some of us are made to feel worthless. We don't come to work to feel any of those things, do we? We come to work to do our job to the best of our ability, to be valued for who we are, to be welcomed for who we are, to be ourselves at work, to do a great job and to go home at the end of the day. And yet this is how we are made to feel at work. And the ironic thing is the people that are doing these to us are probably unaware that they're making us feel like this. And they're no doubt don't intend to make us feel like this. OK, that's very telling, isn't it? So this shows that whilst on the face of it, these micro inequities seem to be small, the impact on us is anything but small. OK, next question. How did it affect your ability to contribute at work at the time? So these micro inequities happened to you. You've already shared how you felt. And we've seen that in a very telling fashion. How did it impact on your ability to contribute at work at the time? I'll let you know what's coming up. So I can, you can't see it, but what's coming up is demotivated, don't want to bother, ignored, uncertain, want to give up, want it to go away, all that kind of stuff. Somebody said, you know, angry. Someone said angry. Sometimes it almost galvanizes us through anger into proving the person wrong but then that's not healthy either we shouldn't have to come to work to be angry yeah someone else has said belittled and apologies for some reason you can't see what's coming up there 
Okay, six million dollar question. Have you ever carried carried out any micro inequities? And for some reason, it looks like you can't see the answer, but oh gosh, 90 plus 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 percent of us are saying that we have carried out micro inequities. So absolutely. So we all receive them. There we go. And we'll go back into the presentation. So the majority of us have experienced micro inequities. The majority of us have done them. And we saw how they made us feel at work. We saw how they made us feel belittled devalued, anxious, and all of those things. So we've established that micro inequities might seem small on the face of it, but their impact on us is anything but. Okay, I'm going to ask you to again reflect on something. What do you think this person does for a living? Now, it's a silly question, I know, because the answer could be absolutely anything. You know, could be ballet dancer, astronaut, or anything. But we will be making a snap judgment on people all the time based on, amongst other things, their appearance. Let me let me answer the actual question first of all, because, you know, in reality, this is what this person does for a living. He's a doctor. And the point of that is not to try and be tokenistic. He's a real doctor, by the way, we've not just dressed somebody up. But the point of that is to say that this person finds that he's treated very differently when he is in the appearance that you see him now as to when he's treated like that. And people will draw all sorts of assumptions about him and behave to him very differently when he's like that than when he's like that. And when he's like that, he gets treated with a lot more deference, a lot more respect. He gets taken a lot more seriously. When he is like that, he has been challenged. He's treated a lot more respectfully. He's been followed around shops by store security and things like that. You know, all the kind of things that you might expect. So why does this happen? Why is the same person treated so differently amongst other things by the way they look? Well, it's to do with something called two system thinking. It's to do with the fact that we as human beings fast think and we slow think. We need to do both. Fast thinking literally was due to survival. You know, right back in the days, you know, real fight or flight when we were confronted by saber toothed tigers, we needed to think quickly to survive. It would be no good as being confronted by that tiger and going, hmm, it's a mammal. Let me ponder and reflect. Is it is is it is it safe? Is it dangerous? Is it hungry? You know, by then we'd be dead. We had to quick think. And to an extent now we do have to use that for, you know, modern day fight or flight. We have to make safety decisions and sometimes they're quick. We also have to use fast thinking to get through the thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of data that we absorb consciously and subconsciously in any day. And just couldn't slow think them all. We couldn't objectify and analyze every single piece of data and that comes our way. So we do fast think a lot of it to get through it. So it does have its place. But when we use fast thinking for something that we should be using slow thinking, this is when unconscious bias creeps in. And it's when we prejudge another person. And it is when having prejudged that person, and we'll usually prejudge that person negatively, especially if that person is different to us, because we have no affinity bias with them. So we tend to trust people more that are like us, and we tend to distrust people more that are different to us. So that combined with the two system thinking, us quickly prejudging somebody based on unconscious bias and stereotypes comes out and shows itself with our micro behaviors and our micro inequities. It actually only takes seven seconds for us to prejudge somebody when we when we meet them. So we think we've got the measure of somebody in only seven seconds, when of course we haven't. And then we will show that with the micro inequities, they're worth less of our time. So they're not as important as us. They won't have anything useful to say. So we'll be looking at our smartphone. We just don't identify with them. We're just not in the same wavelength as them. So we're not included in eye contact. They're just not important enough to us. So we haven't bothered to remember their name, you know, things like that. Not consciously, because we like this person, we value them as a colleague, but subconsciously, we're quick thinking it and that shows in our micro behaviors. This becomes even more serious when we factor microaggressions, which are the everyday insults that typically people from minority ethnic backgrounds experience in a way and to an extent that white people don't. Let's have a look at this. This is 2019 figures. These aren't 10, 20 years old. These are bang up to date. One in seven people from ethnic minorities have been treated as a potential shoplifter in one month against one in 25 people. That, that's wrongly, obviously. 50% of respondents from a minority background believe people sometimes didn't realise they were treating them differently because of their ethnicity. They recognise the fact it wasn't intended, but, but the slight is just the same. 
41% said somebody assumed they weren't British at some point because of their ethnicity when in fact they were British. People from minorities twice as likely as white people to have been mistaken for staff in a restaurant, bar or shop when they weren't. And one in five felt the need to alter their voice or appearance in the last year because of their ethnicity. There's also other research that shows that people will often alter their name. They will anglicise their name. They will, they will put a version of their name that appears to imply they are white British on CVs so that they get more callbacks, so that they get invited to more interviews. And so there's lots of separate research on that as well. So, you know, there's lots there to be concerned with. For example, Pew Research um, in the United States in 2019, so again, bang up to date research, when asked how has your race impacted your own ability to get ahead, around half of, or 52%, more than half of black adults say being black has hurt a little or a lot. And just 5% of white people felt their race or ethnicity has hurt their ability to get ahead. Uh, white people were most likely to say that their race has helped them. 45% plus of white people said their race had helped them. So this microaggression, it's subtle, indirect discrimination against a marginalised group. Now, it doesn't have to be always about race. And there are microaggressions out there against gender, sexuality, physical ability, all that kind of stuff as well. But they are commonly experienced by racial minorities. The dictionary says that they can be unintentional, but that doesn't change the impact and the effect that these actions and statements have on people from minority ethnic backgrounds. And also it's the endless wearing down. So you might challenge a microaggression politely once you might say, look, um, you know, I, I I really don't like it if you call me that. But then you, you've done it 10 times or people have mispronounced your name 10 times. And it just wears you down and you think, do you know what? I, just can't, I haven't got the energy for this anymore. I'm just going to let it go. And it, and it almost you let it wash over you. But that doesn't make it OK. And it doesn't make it any less damaging. OK. So, and the, the thing about this, they feel like racism to the person experiencing it. And but it puts them in a tough position because if they speak out about what seems to be a small incident, you know, especially to the person doing it, they worry it will be seen as disproportionate. They worry that they'll come over as being seen as aggressive. They worry that they'll come over as playing the race card. So the impact of the microaggressions particularly is that they leave people feeling particularly powerless and afraid to speak out, particularly in the workplace where they're worried it might damage their career, you know, or it might hamper them making new professional relationships because they worry people might avoid them because they're going to be seen as a troublemaker. Let's have a look at some examples. These are real case studies. So Lee says, I was called the wrong name by my receptionist in the office every day for six months. She just wouldn't learn my name. This didn't happen with any of my white colleagues. First few times I told her, but then I just gave up. James, I was at a Christmas party. One of my colleagues drunkenly came over to me and put their hands in my hair. I've got short Afro hair. The person rubbed my head and said I felt like a sheep. I mean, that's just not OK, is it? And, you know, I know it's drunken, but that doesn't make it OK. I jerked my head away, but I just kind of smiled awkwardly and snuck off to the bar. I didn't fancy making a scene because I didn't think anybody would back me up. Jeanette, I'm mixed race. I'm constantly asked, no, where are you really from? This is one that happens so often. Can you imagine? Oh, where are you from? Oh, London. No, no, no. I mean, like before that. Oh, oh, the Midlands. No, no, no. I mean, where are you really from? You know, it's this kind of stuff that you wouldn't say to a white person. She felt it does. It's, it's, it might seem like a big deal, but being asked it all the time makes you feel like you don't belong anywhere and you wouldn't ask a white person what you're really saying to me is why do you look different so these are examples of microaggressions I'm going to ask you to ponder some points because it can be about things like accent as well and microaggressions they've been likened to invisible paper cuts and if you can imagine that everyone comes to work at the beginning of the day and during the day, some people will receive more micro inequities and microaggressions than others. And by the end of the day, some people will go home cut to pieces and some people will go home unscathed. If you could see them as cuts, some people would go home cut to pieces and other people would go home unscathed. And then you'd need to look at the characteristics of the people that were cut to pieces and the people that were unscathed. You can bet your bottom dollar that your chief exec would be pretty unscathed. You can bet your bottom dollar that your senior people wouldn't have many. 
you're more junior people might. You could assume that people in minorities in your business would be more likely to. So if you have a minority of women, particularly senior level, that might be one. If you have a minority of people, minority backgrounds, that might be one. People with disability issues might be one. You know, so that's that's how it works. And it can be other things here. It can be something like accent. So points to ponder. How does the accent or appearance of a co-worker impact the credibility that you give to them. So researchers found that people are less likely to believe information when it's from somebody whose accent is different to the dominant accent. So that's one thing. What are the assumptions that you make about the way different colleagues will refer to business interactions or, or clients? There's some research here into race and gender. It done in the States with car salesmen in, and the prices they offered. So they seem to be strongly impacted by race and gender in the prices they offered. So white men were offered cars on average significantly lower than, in ascending order, white women, black women and black men. And the researchers were convinced that the salesmen had no idea that there were patterns to their offer. They weren't intending to be racist or sexist. They were simply trying to get the best price they could from each sale. So that's something to think about, isn't it? And, you know, what are, the, what are other things that might be impacting the way that you involve others? So a way to ponder on this, and I'll ask you to do this individually. So I'm going to ask you to think of somebody, obviously keep it to yourselves, but I'm going to ask you to think of somebody in your team or your wider organisation or even a client, but perhaps somebody in your team that you privately consider to be the least competent how much does this person remind me of me or my in-group? Your in-group are people that are like you. They're people you have an affinity with. They're people you naturally gravitate towards. So how much does this person remind me of me or my in-group? Does this person remind you of someone else? And is that positively or negatively? How do I usually feel during my interactions with that person? And when I talk about them, how often am I using words like they always or they never in relation to their behavior or their performance? What were the last things I said about that person? And what was my last encounter with them like? Because the way we almost go into that encounter, almost preempting it, and with these prejudgments or these kind of pre-assumptions can really influence how we feel about that person and their competence. So, you know, that's one for you to ponder as I was reading that one through. I appreciate we're doing it quickly and, and it might be worth doing this after this webinar to maybe use this and do a little self-reflection because it, it does impact on how we behave towards that person. And then how we behave towards that person is shown by our micro inequities, which that person will then pick up on. So therefore, you know, they'll feel uneasy, they'll feel undervalued, they'll feel anxious, they'll feel ignored, all the things that you put in that menti little word cloud. And so they'll respond back to us accordingly. So it's a vicious circle. Now I'd like you to do the same thing with somebody in your team who you think to be the most competent or in your wider business. Who do you consider to be most competent? And now do the same. How much does this person remind me of me or my own group? Are they like me? Do I have an affinity with them? Does this person remind me of someone else positively or negatively? And is it more likely to be positive? How do I usually feel during my intera interactions with that person? Do I feel good? When I talk about them, how often do I use the words always or never? What was the last thing I said about them? And what was my last encounter with them? Because our evaluation of the, of the person or people, good or bad, will play out in the micro behaviours we display to that person. And they can be picked up by that person and they can still be picked up on virtually. So even if we're engaging more by Microsoft Teams or Zoom or, you know, the virtual world we're increasingly living and working in now, they can still be picked up virtually. So things like our voice, our tone, our body language, and that will in turn influence how the person responds to us. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that can incorrectly reinforce what we incorrectly thought about that person in the first place. So by asking ourselves these questions from time to time, we raise awareness of the mental tape that starts playing automatically in the background when we try and deal with that person, when we try and think of that person. And, and doing that from time to time helps us to be a bit more mindful uh, and to pay mindful attention when we encounter that person next time. It just helps us to frame them more objectively and more accurately and be less vulnerable to bias. And therefore, negative micro behaviours are less likely to be apparent. Challenging ourselves to acknowledge our own bias is another 
powerful step. To really explore our own unconscious bias is another powerful te step. So I'll be exploring some further learning at the end of this session. So if you want to explore that a bit more, you can do that. But the final micro behavior, which is a solution to all of this and is a lovely one, are things called micro affirmation. So this is our final micro behavior. This is a positive one. It's known as tiny acts of opening doors to opportunity, gestures of inclusion and caring and graceful acts of listening. And the great thing about these is that they're things we do anyway. We do them all the time when we remember to do them. They're things like this. They're kind of the opposite to what we looked at before. You know, pay attention to someone. Shut up and let them finish their sentence. Consciously give them eye contact. Think about our body language. Make it positive, open, engaging. If somebody is trying to talk and they're being shouted down, be an ally. Call it out and say, look, I really think we should listen to Jenny here because she's, she's trying to say something and I think it's going to be really helpful. Mentioning the achievements of others. You know, I, I know phone, it's the modern heroine, isn't it? But we put, put our phone away. Just listen to the person person. Remember per someone's name. If we can't remember it, write it down. If we struggle with the pronunciation, write it down phonetically. Asking for opinions. Think about our facial expressions. You know, these kind of little smirks. We know how we feel, so don't do them. And take a professional interest in, in someone. So these micro-affirmations, we can consciously do them. There's a great little mnemonic to help us remember to do them as well. Live listen, include, value, engage. So if we remember to do these each time, you know, listening is the making eye contact, it's the not interrupting, including is inviting people to participate, keeping them in the loop. Valuing is acknowledging compliments, giving people credit where it's due. Engaging is giving people equal airtime, giving fair time in meetings, simply saying hello and goodbye, you know, all of that kind of stuff can be something really simple. You know, next time we're in a meeting, instead of letting the loudest per people shout, you know, if we're chair in the meeting, if we're a manager, simply go around the table, say, right, we're going to go around in order, say everybody's name and say, is there anything you'd like to contribute? You know, give everybody equal airtime. There's simple, practical things we can do. So to wrap this up, four key things to remember about micro inequities and micro aggressions. They're driven by our unconscious bias. Most of us are unaware of what we truly believe about others. We obviously, obviously don't, we often don't take time to unpick it. Once we raise our awareness of our unconscious biases, it enables us to reflect more objectively on our micro behaviors. We promote and surround ourselves with people who we trust. We trust those we like. We like those that are most like ourselves. When we look beyond our comfort zone, we become more objective and our worldview widens. Micro inequities are hard to recognize for people doing them, for bystanders, but they are experienced only too readily by victims. You know yourself, you answered that mentee about how you felt. It's easy for others to discount them as unimportant, but it's important to recognize they're not unimportant. Sometimes when a victim of microaggressions or micro inequities tries to raise it with their manager, they're told to not make a big deal of it and it's devalued. It's important not to do that. OK, so what have we said in conclusion? We have said slow down, objectify, challenge our own assumptions, be mindful about the assumptions we, we make, learn about the worldview of people different from us, encourage speaking out, no bystanders, support the bystanders, don't trivialise if somebody said that something's happening to them that makes them feel uncomfortable, don't trivialise it. Role model the inclusive behaviours, role model the micro affirmations, especially if we're in a leadership or a management position and be open to honest feedback ourselves. So I hope that's given you a little overview of micro behaviours. This is where I would signpost you for further learning. This is just some of it, but there's more virtual learning on the FUR website about micro behaviors, about unconscious bias, and about all sorts of other, you can see all sorts of other things there. So if you go on the, the FUR website, the Supply School website, look at the training list. There's so many things there. Thank you very much for joining in. Thank you very much for listening. This is just the beginning of it. It's just a small snippet. So please spend more time on this. Talk to us afterwards. Yep. Have a look at the 4Ds. Do join us on more webinars. I hope to see you again. Thank you.